Very good. Welcome. So, are we doing prayers or what are we doing? Yes. Yes. Should we get started? present here. Uh, by the way, before I start the, with the prayers, I should uh, tell you that this session is being recorded. And if you don't want to have your uh, presence known in this recording that, uh, well, anyway, by attending you agree to be recorded as that. You can uh, turn off your video if you don't want people to see your picture here, but your presence will still be recorded. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary means to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, Foe Destroyer, Glorious Victorious One, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, Foe Destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary means to be tamed, Supreme One, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, Foe Destroyer, Glorious, victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, Glorious, victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Sorry, I just had to mute somebody. When you, chief of humans, were born, you took seven steps on this great earth, and you said, I am supreme in this world. To you who are wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, Ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector to you I prostrate. Endowed with the supreme marks, a face like the stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you who is free from dust, matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector endowed with great compassion, Omniscient teacher, field of ocean-like merits and good qualities, to the thus gone, I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, through virtue, releases from the evil gone realms, unique, supreme, ultimate meaning, to the Dharma that brings peace, I prostrate. From freedom, teaching the path, well abiding in the pure trainings, Holy field endowed with good qualities, to the Sangha also I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma Refuge, homage to the Great Sangha, to all three ever devout homage. To all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms, and all aspects, with supreme faith I pay homage. Do not commit any non virtuous action. Accumulate virtue and goodness. Subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning and clouds, look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all-seeing and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, May I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence, stained by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. Dry mouth. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. 
I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen and may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. This offering I make of a precious jeweled mandala, together with other pure offerings and wealth, and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. O my masters, my yidams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith. Accepting these out of your boundless compassion, please send forth ways of your blessings. Idam guru ratnam mandala kam nir yatayami. Now we'll read the Heart of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra, sutra the Arya Bhagavat Prajnaparamita Hridaya Sutra. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time, the Bhagavan was dwelling in the mass of Vulture's Mountain on Rajagriha, together with the great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the bodhisattva was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Vadakiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, the venerable Shariputra said this to the bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Vadakiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Valakiteshvara said this to the venerable Shadadvati Putra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also is empty of inherent nature. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no physical form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. There is no eye element, and so on, and up to and including no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. 
There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and up to and including, no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared Tayata gate gate paragate parasam gate buri Tayata gate gate paragate parasangate budi sua. Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from that concentration and commended the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya of Alakateshvara, saying, well said, well said, son of the lineage. It is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan, having thus spoken, the Venerable Shariputra, Shabbatiputra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Varakiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Ashuras, and the Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised. That's spoken by the Bhagavan. Click. Where am I clicking? I'm on. You're on now. Good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so. <clears throat> I was a little late tonight because I was looking in the library for um, a copy of the 84 Mahasiddhas. <clears throat> uh, there's a translator, Keith Delman, who uh, published those a number of years ago in a regular storybook for, form. And then there's uh, I think a little bit shorter version, but with really fantastic uh, drawings by Robert Beer, I believe, uh, called Masters of Enchantment. Uh, and then there's uh, uh, another translation by uh, uh, John Robinson, I believe. So, <clears throat> so that that book has uh, ascended to uh, heavenly realms or um, a copper-colored mountain, <laughs> like that. <clears throat> Usually, uh, when people are talking about the Mahasiddhas, we're uh, talking about it from the standpoint of a person, right? <clears throat> so uh, when we say persons, we could say, well, one of, several of the Mahasiddhas uh, 
in that list, you might be familiar with their names like uh, Naropa and Tilopa, right? <clears throat> Saraha, and uh, even uh, somebody like Shantideva, right? Considered Mahasiddha. <clears throat> so uh, these uh, stories of the Mahasiddhas have like a biography, right? There's a story about what appears to be like a person. So we could say that person uh, is a Mahasiddha or, or that person is regarded as Mahasiddha or that's one of the 84 Mahasiddhas or maybe that um, person's uh, contemporary Mahasiddha like that. Um, uh, in this last, um, in my lifetime, uh, probably a number of uh, teachers uh, would be considered Mahasiddhas. Uh, like uh, Adjuja Rimshe and uh, Ngo Kensei Rimshe, Trungpa Rimshe many times considered Mahasiddha and uh, also a very interesting uh, teacher um, who came to Sacramento that I helped sponsor, Kusum Lingpa, very, uh, <laughs> very spontaneous uh, teacher. Um, uh, but we're, the tendency is to focus in on you know, they're a person, like. Right? So <clears throat> I'd also like to present uh, the Mahasiddha from uh, uh, a non-personal or uh, transpersonal uh, perspective. <clears throat> uh, as you know, I like presenting things uh, as the harmony of the two truths, the truth of relations and the truth of uh, non-relations <clears throat> or absolute truth. The Mahasiddha from absolute point of view, we could say, of course, nature of uh, uh, mind, nature of reality, <clears throat> uh, a Buddha. <clears throat> so, uh, why were they called Mahasiddhas? Why don't we just call them Buddhas? <clears throat> a metaphor I'd like to use to explain Mahasiddhas um, is uh, our viewpoint towards uh, a mountain. <clears throat> uh, the mountain looks uh, one way from the lodge, right? <laughs> You're looking at a mountain maybe from your starting point that's nice uh, uh, and comfortable. Then the mountain uh, looks different when you're actually on the mountain, uh, particularly halfway up. Then the mountain looks different uh, once we reach the summit and looks different on the way down. And then also looks different uh, as we drive uh, maybe or walk far away from the summit, don't you think? <clears throat> so uh, the truth or who or what is Mahasiddha very much depends on one's perspective, don't you think? <clears throat> the perspective that I'd like to address tonight is that uh, when we say Mahasiddha, uh, we're not really um, just referring to a person, um, but we're referring to uh, a mandala, we're referring to uh, the uh, impact of the teachings on us. It's not a surprise that many times when people are studying with the teacher, uh, they don't really um, they're on the mountain, so to speak, uh, or even uh, on the summit of the mountain, and they don't feel the full impact, uh, or they feel a certain kind of impact of the teachings of the teacher, but it's not until the, uh, they're far away from the teacher or they have some distance that um, the impact of the teacher is felt. So is that experience uh, the cause, uh, is it 
because we're far away from the mountain or we see the mountain as big or is it because of our view? Um, I would like to say Mahasiddha is the uh, uh, Mahasiddha uh, principle, so to speak, very similar to uh, the Mandala principle, very similar to uh, uh, the tantric idea of trying to uh, express uh, realization in a poetic and um, creative way. You can't exactly point uh, to uh, <laughs> absolute reality. Um, we, we say pointing out instructions, right? So it looks like you're just pointing to it and saying, there it is. But uh, uh, that's kind of um, a joke. <laughs> we, we have to uh, tell a joke about it. We have to tell a story with somewhat of a punchline. <clears throat> So uh, I wonder if any of you have ever uh, had someone tell you a joke or <laughs> gone to a comedy club and then uh, later you had the laughter or you got the joke later. <laughs> <clears throat> so I'd like to suggest that uh, one big aspect of Mahasiddha is um, the uh, resonance uh, that uh, we experience um, not just in the presence of someone, but also in the non-presence of them, that there's still a sense of uh, uh, wanting to tell their story again or um, retell uh, the joke we heard. Remember as kids, I don't know, I'm still a kid, but we heard a great joke. <laughs> Guys, of course, usually kind of dirty joke or something, but then we, we couldn't wait to tell our friends. <laughs> it's like that. <clears throat> so when we're talking about the Mahasiddhas and there are traditionally the 84 of them, I think on the uh, Facebook, we might've said 87. Sometimes there are a few more counted, <clears throat> but uh, the 84 is kind of a, um, you know, mythical term, like 40 days in the desert, um, 108, uh, Kalesha is 108 realizations, right? So when you say 84, it has a magical number. <clears throat> so the experience of Mahasiddha or great accomplished, um, great accomplishment uh, is pointing to how um, complex and variable uh, the total experience of being a human being in this Sahaja world is like. <clears throat> so when we say Mahasiddha, we're trying to describe um, the whole world from uh, kind of uh, all these different perspectives. So the Mahasiddha experience or the Mahasiddha stories are describing, um, trying to describe uh, both sides of the brocade or trying to, uh, you know, maybe be a little bit like, uh, was it, I don't know, Chilean or Argentinian, Gabriel uh, Marquez, uh, magical realism like that? Someone correct me, what's the right, who's the right author? You're all muted, so <laughs> I can't tell. <clears throat> the Masada approach then is really very interested in um, presenting uh, the complex side of realization. <clears throat> this is why, um, uh, in my opinion, this is why, like many times, Mahasiddhas uh, appear to be um, doing kind of uh, strange things or outrageous things, something like that. Um, uh, that's your perception. That's not theirs. <laughs> They're not doing anything strange, you see. Uh, the idea is uh, the, there's many uh, perspectives. Um, and 
uh, they're looking at the mountain uh, from all these different perspectives, kaleidoscope, mandala kind of perspective. And uh, that's why we really can only tell uh, stories about our experience, stories about um, Hasidas, uh, or tell jokes, because um, any um, philosophic statement or kind of linear statement um, by necessity is going to be uh, limited, right? <clears throat> so the Masida's activities, actually like all our lives, um, are spherical. They're not um, uh, linear like that. We can't just say one thing. We can't just say, uh, let go. <laughs> or um, we can't just say, hold on. We can't just say, this is what that mountain looks like, or this is what the elephant looks like, like that. So uh, when uh, in India, um, these great teachers uh, try to relate with all our society in India, not just other Buddhists or the monastic institutions, uh, they had to um, come up with a creative way of expressing things. Um, and uh, the best way to creatively express things is through uh, these stories that um, demonstrate the, um, the nature of reality is not um, uh, one-sided. So that's why many of the Mahasiddhas uh, don't go along with the regular caste system, um, but they might, or they might be regular uh, monastics like Shantideva, or they might be female, or they might be, uh, you know, eating fish guts like tilopa, or their consorts, a dog like kukaripa, like that. So the idea is not to present oneself as outrageous. That is totally the um, how it's experienced from the other side. Uh, from the experience of the Mahasiddha, they're just being completely ordinary. So maybe uh, we can stop here and uh, take some comments and uh, complaints or questions. <laughs> Hopefully you can all hear me okay. I, I, I'm not in charge of, am I in charge of letting people in? No. The moderator. So Dirk is in charge. Who's the moderator? I am. Oh, I'm, good. I'm right. yeah. On the power, go for it. <laughs> oh. Who gets to call someone out, Mahasid? I, you know, Mahasid isn't, uh, that's a good question. Um, I was asking who gets to call someone a Mazda. Uh, I think it's approbation. Uh, that's not the right word. It's acclamation. So <laughs> maybe approbation too. So I guess uh, in the early years of uh, Christianity in Rome, they didn't elect the Pope. You know, they just would uh, kind of put forth their hero, right? Like that. So. Once again, I don't think a masjid is something that uh, one is given a certificate for or appointed necessarily. That it it comes as a as the impact of uh, the uh, activity is felt upon individuals like that. <clears throat> I don't know. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, maybe it sometimes helps for someone in authority. Of course, someone in authority. Could say like that person really is is a great Mahasiddha, and um, you know we can accept that on authority. But um, even then, it has to be uh, it's the impact um, that's felt. <clears throat> Would it be fair to say that uh, that the experience of the Mahasiddha? or what we're perceiving as that experience is actually not an object of knowledge for us? It's not something that we can uh, conceptualize? Um, 
Yeah, that's kind of, uh, that's why I like um, the idea of a story or a joke. That's uh, a common joke or a well-known story. So let's say we're just telling uh, a folk story over and over, um, but we're telling it in such a way that the audience is entranced, right? I used to go to storytelling, storytelling festivals uh, in North San Juan outside of Nevada City and the storytellers would be telling traditional stories, um, but they would be so fascinating uh, that you you just enjoyed hearing it over again in a new way. But no one owns the story, so it's the impact. You know, uh, something is uh, transmitted um, in the sacred biographies, which are like stories and also somewhat like uh, complex jokes but you can't say who owns it. So that's what's so wonderful about um, these wonderful teachers that I've met in my life. Uh, you know, no one really owns them, you know? People try to own them. And when we, say, when we see that people try to own teachers or lineages, you know, then uh, it can get, you know, rather tarnished. But uh, these fantastic teachers, like, they have a sense of totally being um, uh, with the community, but um, it's common property. No one owns it like that. I hope that's helpful. I don't know. <laughs> Lama? Hi. Uh, this, this is uh, it's Morris. Does this mean that we actually don't really understand the actual deeds of the Mahasiddhas. We only understand them by analogy. Uh, no, you get the joke. You don't want to explain the joke, you know? We well, can't explain the joke. There's something opaque there, there's something that's not um, uh, commonsensical to ordinary beings, right? Uh, yes and no. I don't I don't think it's that magical. It's, it's just like there's a... You know, like uh, that's why I want to say it, it's like a storyteller who's telling uh, a story that we all already know, um, but uh, it's it's done in a, a, such a fresh way that that you know the liveness is communicated. So mm. it's both ordinary and uh, very uh, fresh at the same time, like that. Mm. So. Uh, you know, it, it'd be like somebody uh, said, oh my gosh, you know, what, I've never tasted a um, cheesecake like this before. What's in it? And you just kind of go, I don't know, it's just the regular cheesecake that I make. Or in fact, like, you think it's really special, but I, I just, it's a Sara Lee's cheesecake from Safeway, you know? But it's fantastic, it's like that. So it's totally ordinary and, um, you know, but you're, it's, uh, we're maybe eating it with fresh tongue or something like that. So it's the same. So, uh, uh, you know, to make kind of, these wonderful teachers that uh, I've had the luck to meet or karma. So actually they're totally approachable. Yeah, so, um, so, you know, you can, that's, that's what's funny, you know, a lot of times you see you think of people emerging from the clouds, of course, and, um, or being these fantastic beings, but um, uh, at the same time, uh, you can have a cup of coffee with them. Mama? Yes. I'm one, I'm, I'm okay. I think I'm remembering from some of the stories, um, that the Mahasiddhas were seen by ordinary folks as, you know, pretty eccentric. But the people for whom, the people that they were meant to teach, the people that were meant to be their students, they didn't seem that way at all. They got it. But everybody else saw them as pretty eccentric. 
um, like reading those stories? Well, the, uh, the piece I'm pitching tonight is that uh, um, if we need to see them as eccentric, we'll see them as eccentric. If we need to see them as ordinary, we'll see them as ordinary. So there are many great teachers that um, uh, present as entirely ordinary. And of course, if we're looking for um, really weird stuff or extraordinary stuff, we'll, we'll totally miss it. But um, uh, realization is entirely ordinary. So uh, that, that's the thing. We don't have to be, uh, we don't have to be particularly ordinary or extraordinary. It's whatever um, uh, is appropriate at the time, really. So, you know, one of the real uh, defining pieces for me of Masad is, is a really uh, profound extension of Bodhisattva vow and skillful means. So uh, you can be extraordinary at times uh, or obtuse, or you might be just completely, um, you know, just uh, a cup of tea is a cup of tea, right? You know, cigar is a cigar. You know, there's nothing beyond that. <clears throat> that so it's like the Dalai Lama would be considered a Mahasiddha. Could be, you know, it's like, uh, uh, but the, I think the Mahasiddha experience is, happens in the in-between. You know, so it happens as an interrelationship between uh, your mind, so to speak, if we could say your mind and Dalai Lama's mind. So it's it's going to arise um, in the middle. Because of course, if you just see the Dalai Lama as ordinary person, then that's ordinary too. That might be actually really important at some point in our practice like that. <clears throat> so, Lama La, hi. Oh, hi. Doesn't Dalai Lama always say and always start off the teaching, I consider myself ordinary monk and nothing more, right? That's very ordinary. Yes, I, you know, he does like that. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't think, uh, yeah, he's not carrying around the idea, I'm the Dalai Lama and you're not, you know, that's, that's the really nice thing. So, uh, you know, like just presenting exactly, you know, uh, the way we can meet. So uh, it's, it's wonderful just to meet people and be ordinary. Sometimes we make ordinary into a special thing and then we get stuck on ordinary right <laughs> so but yeah like that <laughs> uh you know i think it, he's made a very strong statement to be relatable to work with uh, um uh relations you know the world of relations that's why the world of relativity um you know teachers get famous um but uh you know one point you when the Dalai Lama came to the United States, I think in the uh, early 80s, you know, he could just go over and say hi. <laughs> Same with Trung Parimshe, you know, like uh, when I first got to Boulder, they, I said, when do you meet Trung Parimshe? And uh, there was a famous bar on Pearl Street. <laughs> you just go down and just have a seat, literally like that. But then what's weird is that, of course, looking back, I can say, well, just these very ordinary things had a profound uh, changing in my life, right? Changed direction, right? So could, was that really an ordinary situation, right? Because it was ordinary, I could let it in. Like, oh, I can just actually just say hi to this person like that. You know, just very, very direct. <clears throat> Personally, I, I, you know, I like, um, I like kind of ordinary, <laughs> uh, at least to begin with. So one teacher that presents as uh, very ordinary that we've brought here, of course, is Arjun Rinpoche, uh, who's just seems like 
hi, you know, <laughs> like that. <laughs> but um, not at all ordinary. <laughs> or not just ordinary, of course, ordinary, you know. Like that. It's interesting. So uh, when I was studying with a number of my teachers, you know, Chunji Rimshe was close uh, with Dujim Rimshe. I would say, well, you know, what was it like being Dujim Rimshe's attendant? And what do you think he said? Kind of ordinary. Ordinary, ordinary. <laughs> yeah, kind of ordinary, you know, like, uh, but of course, that's when you're, you know, on the mountain, so to speak, or even when you're at the summit, you know, uh, around uh, Dujim Rimshe would be these other fantastic teachers, you know, it's like a magnet, you know, so um, same way with Karmapa, but sometimes when you'd actually meet them, they were just kind of like, hi, what's on your mind, right, you know, like, so you wouldn't see the gravitational pull, right? You wouldn't see uh, until uh, you know later you could see the pattern, right? We can't see the Milky Way uh, ourselves. We have to like get a telescope or something, right? And then you can see the Milky Way. So uh, it's uh, um, maybe kind of uh, ordinary talk like that. <clears throat> Ahmed Ellen, I have a question. Yeah. Why did you decide to introduce the Mahasiddhas at this point in the Buddha Dharma study program? Is there a, a, a reason why it fits well? Around tenants, or it's the reason. <laughs> uh, I would just ruin the fun. Yeah, kind of said, I just gave away the joke. You know. <laughs> so uh, maybe it's better just to say there there is a reason. So usually, of course, um, we you know we separate you know all these facets we think okay this this study um has uh nothing to do with these uh these uh, fantastical stories and beings right um uh, but one clue is uh we we talk about um the tenants as you know trying to get um our view as precise uh as possible, right? In in India, they liked getting things very, very short as possible, actually. So that's why it's sometimes really hard to translate basic text because if you translate like um, the middle way verses, the karkas of Nagarjuna, literally, it just it just seems like I don't know computer code, right? There's no verbs or anything. It's weird, <clears throat> but. Um, uh, direct uh, instructions, sometimes we call pith instructions or pointing out, are generally like that too. So, uh, you know, something, uh, an example I like to quote um, for those who have read um, uh, Patra Shea's words of my per perfect teacher, uh, and I think I have this right, so you can correct me if wrong, but uh, when he was a student under Do Kensei one time, uh, who's a very exotic teacher. Uh, they were just lying on the ground looking at the stars and uh, Kensei said, uh, do you hear uh, those dogs barking? And uh, Patron said, yes. Uh, and Do Kensei said, that's it. And had a big realization, right? Sounds like a Zen story, right? Yeah, but you have to have so we can hear that story, we can hear repeat that kind of joke, but um, of course we're doing an explanation uh, because we may not be bringing that that kind of practice uh, to that moment the way Pat Rimshe did, or or maybe you do get the joke. <laughs> 
So uh, it's like that. So tenets um, are very much like uh, pith instructions, like that, um, uh, or like climbing a mountain, um, you know, where somebody's just saying, put, put your hand over here, like that. Uh, generally very profound instructions or profound speech tends to be um, uh, very short. So, you know, you have a baby girl. Um, your father is dead. Uh, I love you. I don't love you anymore. Um, it's over. You know, it's very short, right? Just very pithy. Uh, there generally is not long explanations about really profound things, right? Like that. Sky is blue. <laughs> Grass is blue. <laughs> like that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So I, uh, I want to end a little early today at eight o'clock so that we don't um, over uh, explain and uh, do that. <clears throat> So short discussions, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, Zen teachers, of course I've lived in Zen monasteries, you know, <laughs> um, you hear stories that they just uh, hit, sometimes hit the lectern with their fan or, and they go, that's the Dharma talk, right? So would, would you think that was like totally cool? Like, great, um, or would you think, wait a minute, wait a minute, uh, I want a longer talk for my money. Uh, there was one talk with Trung Perushe where I uh, came on stage and uh, said, I have nothing to tell you. That was it. So for um, some people, incredibly profound, compassionate, uh, for other people like WTF, you know, I drove two hours to get here. I drove, I waited two hours and okay, like that. So, um, so <laughs> like, like that. <laughs> I don't know, think about it. Would it be okay? Would that be okay? Um, it's not about accepting it, you know. Um, so, uh, you know, would you be, you don't have to be amused, you know, it's not like you're thinking like, well, that was really funny, I got the joke. Um, you know, maybe the transmission for you, the Mahasiddha experience was like, you know, just being pissed. Okay, it doesn't have to be like, I have to find some mysterious, uh, you know, uh, thing about all this, right? <clears throat> so interesting. One, one more question, then we can do our prayers. Hey, someone out there, take a risk. <laughs> like that. <clears throat> I was just, for Verde Lama, I was just going to have a comment when you said, uh, I, I kind of had an experience what you said about, you know, somebody just gets up to the lectern and then they say, that's it. When I was very early into Buddhism, when I was um, living in Idaho, we had a teacher come from the East Coast, and it, you know there was there's not a whole lot of places, you know, big temples or anything in Idaho. So we were at somebody's house, and it was really well attended. But we sat there actually for it must have been two and a half or three hours, and the teacher was sitting in the front, but he never taught anything, and we meditated for two or three hours and then it was a weekend teaching. So then the next day, you know, I don't know who didn't come back, but I came back the next day and it was like, well, nobody asked the teacher to teach. So he didn't, we just sat there and meditated and it was, it was really, it was okay actually. Yeah, that's a good example. Do you remember who the teacher was by any chance? Um, you know, I have a hard time with all their names. So no, but I could, I could, I could pick them out of a lineup if I had to. Let's see, uh, it left an impact on you, you see? It was, uh, it was a good one, actually. Yeah. Uh, it left an impact. 
Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, good example. Like that. <clears throat> the, the first time I had a chance to talk to Trung Purimshe, of course, like everybody, I like <laughs> had to tell my whole story, right? The poor man, right? <laughs> and then what do you think he said? Uh, you know, comment. I mean, I was not long, but maybe two minutes. You know, someone talking you know, pouring out their guts and I can't, I waited so long to meet you and here's what I've done, you know, for two minutes. What do you think he said? You think too much. <laughs> and I was just like, I went home and I was just furious, just furious. This is like 1971. Like, WT, <laughs> um, but that would hooked me, right? That hurt me for reals, right? Like, you know, like that. So that combination of outrage, and of course that was totally ordinary and completely right on. You know, I wasn't trying to be outrageous, just like, um, well, you know, you think too much. So was that outrageous or ordinary or both? But the impact, whether it was ordinary or outrageous, uh, uh, was just the right thing for me to hear and for him to say at the time. <laughs> Still probably true, by the way. <laughs> okay, let's let's end with dedication prayers. Shall we? So Okay. I'm giving it a moment to be sure that it's broadcasting correctly. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of the Guru Buddha and leave all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chin Razi, Tenzin Jansu, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Losan, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instruction to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. Manju Shri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Mars. Tsongkhapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Losang Dragpa, I make request at your holy feet. Now we'll move to a different screen for the prayer that saved Sakya. The verses that saved Sakya from sickness, a prayer for pacifying the fear of disease by Teng Tong Galpo. May all the diseases that disturb the minds of sentient beings and which result from karma and temporary conditions, such as the harms of spirits, illness, and the elements, never occur throughout the realms of this world. May whatever sufferings arise due to life-threatening diseases, which, like a butcher leading an animal to the slaughter, separate the body from the mind in a mere instant, never occur throughout the realms of this world. May all embodied beings remain unharmed by acute, chronic, and infectious diseases the mere names of which can inspire the same terror as would be felt in the jaws of Yama, Lord of Death. May the 80,000 classes of harmful obstructors, the 360 evil spirits that harm without warning, the 424 types of disease and so forth, never cause harm to any embodied being. 
May whatever sufferings arise due to disturbances in the four elements, depriving the body and mind of every pleasure, be totally pacified. And may the body and mind have radiance and power and be endowed with long life, good health, and well-being. By the compassion of the gurus and the three jewels, the power of the Dakinis, Dharma protectors and guardians, and by the strength of the infallibility of karma and its results, may these many dedications and prayers be fulfilled as soon as they are made. Thank you, Lama La. Uh, does anyone have any announcements for any closing comments? Oops. I see I turned off my video by mistake. Yeah, so um, uh, sometimes it's really good to uh, read some of the Namtar, the uh, stories of the Mahasiddhas, uh, even the stories of contemporary teachers. Um, uh, sometimes the best thing to read uh, to revive our Dharma practice when it becomes a little stale is uh, the short and long biographies like that, uh, so that we are, uh, feel a sense of uh, closeness, because that's what the stories do. When you're with a good storyteller, you, you feel that um, the beings of the story are present, don't you? So um, uh, please uh, don't distract yourself totally from tenants but uh, when you find yourself getting a little stale in meditation, of course, uh, add more light or splash water on your face. And if you feel yourself getting a little stale with tenants, then uh, uh, perhaps uh, you need to read the story of like uh, Saraha or <laughs> Tilopa, something like that, or from uh, uh, Indrabhuti, right? Something like that and uh, maybe a little homework. Uh, so next time we talk, who are the four female Mahasiddhas? So a little challenge to y'all. So we'll talk soon. Omahung. <laughs> Good.